without having Bible preaching and teaching out of the Word of God. That's our main purpose. And so I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter number 25. And obviously I'm going to be briefer this evening than I usually am. Now folks, I know that a lot of this business stuff is boring, um, but it's something that I feel that we need to tend to anyway. And uh, bear with me, we only do this once a year. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> um, I know it's boring. And uh, by the way, the Lord has been very good to the church. As I say, I don't publish those figures anymore. But anybody interested can ask me privately or ask one of the board members privately. And they can give you uh, the preciseness on some of the things. The Lord has been very, very good to us. In Acts chapter number 25, we have Festus coming into the room of Felix out of chapter number 24. And Festus uh, had the fellows from Jerusalem come up to meet with Paul at Caesarea and then ask Paul if he would go with them down to Jerusalem. And the apostle Paul uh, told uh, Festus in so many words uh, no, I am not going down to Jerusalem. Their intent is not to have a fair trial or a genuine a court hearing. Their intent is to kill me. I have done nothing wrong. And remember, I used the phrase, please, that the Apostle Paul used in verse number 10 of chapter 25. And the last part of the verse, he told Festus, to the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. And then he, of course, said, If I be an offender, I refuse not to take my punishment, which is definitely a good attitude. But under the circumstances, he said, uh, I have not done these things that they say, nor can they prove them, and I am making my appeal unto Caesar. And that is in verse number 11, the last sentence. I appeal unto Caesar. And Festus, after conferring with his counselors, uh, told Paul that he would be sent to Caesar, which meant that Paul would be sent to the city of Rome. You may recall, please folks, that the Lord had stood by Paul and told him that he must bear witness of him in Rome. Do you remember when we studied that? And sure enough, Paul is going to Rome. He's not going probably like he had planned it out at the start. Uh, sometimes God changes our plans, but hey, he did get a free trip uh, to Rome. Uh, and got a lot of witnessing in in the process. So he goes to Rome. Uh, but Festus had a problem in sending Paul to Rome, to Caesar, because he didn't have anything to accuse Paul of. He had no indictment against Paul. And he was, as I said last week, somewhat embarrassed uh, to do this. And uh, so we have here that the Apostle Paul is kept in, uh, uh, incarcerated, so to speak, even though I think he had freedom uh, within the castle there. And after certain days, verse number 13 of 25 of Acts says as follows. After certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face 
and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. By the way, there's an important principle involved there uh, in law. In verse number 17, Therefore, when they were come hither, they came up to Caesarea, without any delay, on the morrow I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth, against whom, when the accuser stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition. Uh, the word translated here is superstition. And you may recall from Acts chapter number 17 that tremendous or oratory of the Apostle Paul at Mars Hill at Athens. You may recall that he told the men of Athens that he perceived that in all things they were too or very superstitious. And a lot of people say, well, that's a wrong way uh, to look at it. But I would like to suggest that we have a correct translation here that to many people religion is superstition. To many people outside the household of the Christian faith, our Christian faith is but a superstition. About a pie in the sky kind of hope. Well, we don't feel that way. I believe it's real. I believe it's the only real hope there is. Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, but that being said, I want to say this. Much religion in the world, much that comes under the word religion is kind of superstitious. And thereby you come along with this word in our Bible. And, and this reveals to us a little bit of what Festus felt about the thing. Uh, it's too bad that he did not search and find the truth, and he could have if he searched, because Jesus said, Seek and ye shall find. Uh, but it reveals to us a little bit about Festus and his thought, at least in my opinion, uh, toward the truth of Christianity and the truth of uh, uh, Judaism. Now then, he said, going further, uh, it was about their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Man, you talk about the gospel. Do you think Festus heard the gospel? I think he did. I think every time he communed with Paul, Paul tried to get a word in of witness for the salvation available in Jesus Christ our Lord. And now you're getting the scene, I hope. Festus is talking to King Agrippa and Bernice, and he says, I've got somewhat of a problem here. There's a man left over from Felix's reign as procurator or governor, and uh, this uh, business is somewhat problematic for me, and he's explaining it to Agrippa. And in his explanation to Agrippa, he says, Jesus, which was dead, and that's true, but whom Paul affirmed to be alive, and that's true. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, Ye see this man, about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here being Caesarea, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, 
and that he himself hath appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him. But I have this problem. That's my uh, commentary. Verse 26 says, Of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. He's referring to Caesar when he says, My Lord. He's not talking about our Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not with all to signify the crimes laid against him. Hey, pretty plain language, isn't it? I mean, uh, what? You don't even need a commentary on this. It comes out pretty good here. What we have is... King Agrippa, uh, so-called King Agrippa, allowed to be called King Agrippa by Caesar over in Rome. And as I told you last week, this is Agrippa the second, actually, and he is the seventh in the line of the Herods, the seventh and the last of the Herodian line in Judea there. Now, we have Agrippa saying, I'd like to hear about him. And uh, so Festus says, well, certainly, I'd like that. He says, I have a problem anyway. I don't have anything to accuse this guy of. And, you know, there's public money being spent and getting him over there. And there's a centurion that's guarding him and the soldiers and so on. And, and uh, I'm sending this guy, what's Caesar going to say? What's wrong with this Festus down there. Uh, he sent me this guy, and well, what for? Why did he send him to me? Uh, of course, I don't know whether you can, but I can see God moving behind the scenes in every bit of this thing. Because you'll remember that along the way, Paul got much witnessing in for the Lord. And you'll remember also that many in Caesar's household heard the word and believed. Now, we're going to get to that. But before I do, I give just a little bit of background and then we're going to be closing out uh, the service for this evening because of my time already being up. But I do want to try to get this in, if I may. Uh, a couple of points to be made. One is the Caesar to whom Paul is appealing is actually none other than, and you've heard of him, Nero Caesar. Hey, you say, but Brother Burkholder, it just said Augustus. Forgive me, I have to look up my notes to get this guy's name down. He got a whole bunch of names. Um, Nero's name was actually Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. How would you like that for your name? Now, we know from secular history, and I cited Tacitus last week, uh, I cited other secular uh, historians. Uh, Tacitus was an official Roman historian, a senator from the Roman Senate. His uh, histories and annals, uh, of which uh, many are available even today in uh, that manuscript form that he had. I also cited Josephus, who was a Jew, and yet in favor with Roman, and Josephus was the official Jewish historian at that time. So you can really put some stock in what Josephus had to say. Uh, and this being the case, we know from crossover dates that Nero was the Caesar at the time. Yes, it's that Nero you've heard about. You say, I, I hadn't heard about it, Nero. I, I suspect you have. Have any of you ever heard the statement, Nero fiddled while Rome burned? It's a famous one. Well, you've heard it now. And, uh, 
and and that is historical fact by the way uh, that is uh, not uh, coming from the Bible this is coming from secular historians but it was at that time it seems as though that Nero Caesar was on the throne of the Roman Empire uh, from around the vicinity of 56, 54 to 56 AD uh, to 64, 65, 66 AD, somewhere in there. At any rate, he was the Caesar that was definitely on the throne when the Apostle Paul was having this hearing before Agrippa, when the Apostle Paul was standing before Festus and appealed to Augustus, he was making his appeal to the Caesar on the throne at that time, who happened to be Nero Caesar. Uh, a little bit of perhaps trivia for you that I think will be somewhat interesting. <clears throat> There are many historians who believe that Nero set Rome on fire himself. There are those who believe that he set it on fire because he wanted to have room to make a grand complex in the city of Rome for himself. Hence the phraseology coming, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. He didn't literally... Uh, use a fiddle like we sometimes think. He, he, he just uh, was going at it. Now this Nero was not a nice guy. Uh, this Nero was one to wipe out anybody who got in his way. This particular Nero is cited in secular history as rounding up I, I, I hate to say this it's, uh, it's uh, somewhat disturbing and, and troubling I'm just going to give it to you so you can understand a little bit about Nero because it's going to have bearing on the Apostle Paul's ministry later on Nero according to historians gathered up Christians and burned them at night in his gardens to have light in his gardens at night. This is the Nero that we're talking about. This is the Nero that the Apostle Paul has appealed to. Uh, in his appeal to Nero, it is said to be Augustus, but that seems to have been just a standard uh, uh, title uh, in some ways, kind of like we would refer to a congressman or president or prime minister, uh, something like that, a leader of the country. This is definitely that Nero Caesar. Now, one more thing that I, I need to bring to your attention tonight, if I may, is about Agrippa. Do you remember my saying last week that the Herods considered themselves Jews? Not all Jews considered the Herods Jewish. But the Herods did convert, at least outwardly, to Judaism. They were from actually the area of Idumea during the time of Christ, which was formerly that area known as Edom. Yes, out of the descendants of Esau. Now, Agrippa is the last of the Herods. As I say, they converted to Judaism. Bernice was Agrippa's sister. And I talked about Drusilla, Felix's wife, last week. Do you remember? Drusilla seems to likewise have been the sister of Agrippa, from what I can find out. I bring this to our attention to show in the Bible it called Drusilla a Jewess. Now, what 
is being presented to us here is someone who is not nominally familiar but very well familiar with Judaism. Now that being the case, you've got the Apostle Paul being brought out before Agrippa and the Apostle Paul in his being brought out before Agrippa as I read last week starts off in chapter number 26 in this way. Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. And here's what he said. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Verse 3, look at it. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Are you getting the picture of what's going on here? The Apostle Paul is an expert on Judaism too, is he not? Have you read the book of Philippians? A Pharisee, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, but he got saved on the road to Damascus and started serving the Lord. We have this Apostle Paul coming before Agrippa, and a lot of people are not aware that the Herods actually converted over to Judaism. And thus you have Herod's temple in Jerusalem and so on and the Western Wailing Wall that still uh, remains to this day that was part of the Temple Mount complex that Herod the Great had made in the time of Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, here we have then this, if I may so say, the Apostle Paul... <clears throat> who had been um, a Pharisee among the Pharisees. And while we usually use that phraseology in a rather negative way, I would like for you to consider that in some ways the Pharisees had some very good points to them. And I, I think that uh, the Apostle Paul really thought he was doing the right thing until he came to the realization, Who art thou, Lord? He, and he was talking about the Messiah. And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus. And then Paul converted, got saved, and worked just as hard for, or harder for Jesus, after he got saved, as he did against Jesus before he got saved. So it is this Paul who is, am I safe in saying, I feel I am safe and sane, expert in both Judaism and Christianity. Before Agrippa, who is a Jew. And what... Oh, my time is gone. I'm sorry. Forgive me for going so long. I'll say this and we'll close out tonight. What did Paul have to say before King Agrippa? Basically... He gave his testimony of how he came to Christ. Read it for yourself. And we'll get into it next Wednesday night more. But the Apostle Paul says, I'm, I'm glad to answer you because, hey, listen, Agrippa, you're familiar with the Old Testament Scriptures. You're familiar with Isaiah chapter number 53. You're familiar with Isaiah chapter number 55. You're familiar with Isaiah chapter number uh, 8 in there. Uh, Agrippa, you're familiar with the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Messiah. And, and you're familiar with all this business about Jesus Christ because, hey, listen, your home spot is down there in Jerusalem. That's where his castle was, overlooking the Temple Mount there. And the Apostle Paul says, I think myself happy. <laughs> because I shall answer for myself before this day. Oh, wait, one more thing. And this is by way of commentary, I know. 
But why was Paul so happy to talk to Agrippa? Was it because he thought, Agrippa, you'll understand my position and let me go? Was that it? I don't think so. You know why I think Paul was so happy to be before Agrippa? Because I think the Apostle Paul, as his manner was, thought, I'm going to give a witness to the saving power of Jesus Christ before King Agrippa. That's why I think Paul was happy. And I'd like to get into that, but we'll do so next Wednesday night. In the meantime, I'd like to ask you if you have any prayer requests you'd like to make known, and then I'll close this out in a word of prayer uh, for this evening. Does anyone have a prayer request that they would like to make known? Marsh?